Narendra Rat Lal, as well as my fellow old girl, Bond University alumnus, and my Kai, Honorable Tanya Onganika. Eleven women members of parliament now in the house. What a milestone achievement as we celebrate today the end of 16 days of activism against violence against women and children. As a survivor of violence myself, I stand tall for all women and children who continue to face this national shame for which we as leaders must band together to eliminate. I'd also like to warmly congratulate on their appointments, our party leader, the Honorable Ngawaka, and our deputy party leader, my colleague and friend, Mr. Filimoni Wasarongo. I wish to also congratulate the Honorable Ratune Ngama Lalambalavu on his election as the leader of opposition, and as the whip, I look forward to working with him closely. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, in early December 2017, I was formally invited to bring two political parties together by someone that believed in my sacrifice and potential to add value in the interests of our beloved nation. Three years later, almost to the day, the former leader of opposition, Mr. Sitiveni Rambuka, sacrificed his seat in this esteemed house because he believed that bringing together the floor, us across the floor in bipartisanship would be in the best interest of our beloved nation. And I wish to remind the other side of the house that he has indeed left and they, it's upon them, they keep resurrecting him into the house. Mr. Speaker, I would like to honor his sacrifice and selfless spirit by standing here today and saying to all parties, we are here to add value, let us help. In this time of crisis, our people are not interested in their leaders shouting at each other across the floor, swearing at one another, or fighting, which the media just loves to highlight on their front page. Our people are fatigued and looking for solutions to very basic daily needs. Food, water, and roof over their heads. Our people struggle with job losses that have forced them to look for alternative sources of income, mostly without government assistance or even FNPF help. Many of our people struggle with paying water and electricity bills. So their water is cut and they are getting water from a kind neighbor. Our people struggle with paying mortgages which will soon return, they're cut because they cannot pay the bill. Our people struggle with paying more mortgages, which will soon return to full interest and principal payments needing to be made as COVID-19 concessions expire. Our people are losing hope and faith in the government that is responsible for spending their hard-earned taxes to take care of them. So they look to parliament, which includes the opposition, to provide solutions that can save lives. As the Honorable Anthony Albanese, the Australian opposition leader, recently said, while supporting government incentives, and I quote, not because it's perfect, but because it's urgent. And in that spirit, I also vow to keep making suggestions until the government gets it right. Now, Honorable Speaker, addressing His Excellency's speech, we need more than just rhetor rhetorical challenges. It requires all of us to roll up our sleeves and get to work now. Not since World War II has the world or our beloved Fiji been faced with such devastating consequences as those wrought by COVID. But just like World War II, my deep respect and admiration goes out to the sacrifices of the men and women on the front line. Our doctors, our nurses, our armed forces, airport staff, and the many other citizens who turn up to work and get the job done. You all deserve a medal and our sincerest and most heartfelt gratitude. One of the most important lessons I've seen from COVID, Honorable Speaker, is cutting down costs and becoming self-reliant. This holds true for our beloved nation. Now, while the Attorney General, the Honorable Attorney General, has attempted to cut costs in the budget, such as cutting leadership salaries by as much as 20%, I believe more wastage needs to be eliminated. For instance, I would humbly suggest we have less fleets of gas-guzzling Prados rushing off to yet another celebration or event, and maybe more convoys of Priuses visiting senior citizen homes, orphanages, heart communities, displaced residents, squatter communities, and the homeless. In the interest of cutting down expenditure, we must take an honest look at the type of sacrifices we all need to make. 
I believe that the discussions around budget reductions, such as the possible reduction of civil servant salaries, must be one done in the true spirit of transparency and with dignity, especially in the light of civil servants being let go with the offer of redundancies. Would it not be a viable alternative to reduce civil servant salaries so that all remain employed and share the burden together rather than seeing their colleagues in the hundreds go home and add to the already high numbers of unemployed people and more burdens on, on FNPF and the social security system with no guarantee of security and stability for their future? Aggressive cost-cutting measures are just the beginning. As my Kai Honorable Ngeren Geritambo rightly pointed out, and I quote, the true test of our metal will come once the borders reopen and efforts are ramped up to kickstart the economy through tourism. This will indeed be a daunting challenge. A recent International Finance Corporation business survey found that half of all tourism-related businesses in Fiji are closed, dissolved, or hibernating. One does not need to look far to see the crumbling state of hotels and thousands of unemployed hotel workers. Former hotel workers that have helped out in our outreach have returned to their villages for their livelihood, and herein lies what I believe to be the answer to addressing His Excellency's speech about our response to COVID and what is needed for our economic recovery. I had already alluded to this in my response to the budget address but I'm obliged to keep repeating it till something meaningful is done. Fiji needs that agricultural revolution and it needs it now. Not piecemeal attempts like the Honorable Minister Reddy was detailing yesterday without any dollar value. Not the piecemeal attempts by the government that still sees a meager budget allocation of less than 10% of our GDP. A large portion of money saved from our national budget cost-cutting measures and sourced from overseas funds must be directed to re revitalizing our agriculture, infrastructure, and knowledge. To grow Fiji's economy, we must grow Fiji's agricultural foundation, which is key to faster recovery and poverty reduction. Recent studies by the World Bank in, done in the Philippines have found that, and I quote, transforming the country's farming and food systems is even more important during the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure strong food value chains, affordable and nutritious food, and a vibrant rural economy." Unquote. The World Bank report highlights the importance of modernizing and adding value to the agriculture sector. How do we do that? By redirecting our resources to investing in our agricultural infrastructure, diversifying our agricultural products, and value adding. Firstly, we need to invest more into our agricultural infrastructure. We have to upgrade our ease of access to modern agricultural equipment. Recently, a Popo farmer was asked why they couldn't compete with their counterparts in Hawaii. He smiled and said, while most farmers in Fiji look up to the sky and try to guess the reasons why our soil might not be healthy, farmers in the United States stick a pen-like device called CropEx in the ground, and it sends information about the type of fertilizer needed and how much to use, when you can invest, how big the harvest, and how weather will affect it, all to their smartphone via satellite. That type of technology is available to Fiji farmers, but isn't widely used, not because they can't afford it, but because most Fiji farmers have button phones, and even if they have smartphones, they would not be able to connect to the network. The proposed tower sharing arrangement with a consistent power supply will certainly complement this type of technology. Government must increase their incentives and grants given to small and medium farmers and businesses to upgrade both their tools and knowledge. A simplified way of looking at it could be that if the government used $90 million of its annual budget to help finance 10 new large private agricultural businesses at $9 million each, in five years we would have 10 large agricultural businesses employing thousands of people and generating over $100 million per year in revenue, which could form the basis of Fiji's agricultural revolution. $90 million 
a year spent on developing commercial scale agricultural businesses pales in comparison to the billions of dollars that the government spends on working on our roads. Incidentally, this is the annual budget for the military. Maybe it's time to, reconsider, to consider repurposing some of the military's role to more income generating projects in several sectors, including the agriculture sector that will help the economy grow. The military is already doing small scale farming with the planting and harvesting of those Taiwanese breed guavas as well as vegetables in the Nasinu Army Training Group that the military sells to our local supermarkets. Of course, it goes without saying that proper management and upskilling locals is crucial in ensuring the long-term sustainability of any such initiatives, but it is possible. Government policies must encourage farmers to invest in the latest farming equipment and to be trained in it. We cannot allow cheap farm machinery made in Asia to flood the market and keep us in the Stone Age. Our failing sugar industry can only be revived if more is done to improve its quality and quantity through technology. In Fiji, we average only about 40 tons per hectare, while our neighboring Australia averages twice that, and many other countries about three times that amount. Increasing our yields are directly linked to our use of appropriate technology. I mention appropriate technology because millions of dollars have been spent on sugar cane milling machines that end up not being used because they were the wrong specifications. Secondly, diversifying our agricultural products is crucial in securing our future. If we do not have the money or knowledge to invest in keeping our flailing sugar industry alive, we must find an alternative that can replace it. I believe, honorable speaker, industrial hemp can replace sugar as the backbone of the economy. Now, before the Fiji Sun prints a Linda becomes drug queen headline, let me just state this for the record. Industrial hemp is not marijuana, and I repeat that. Industrial hemp is not marijuana. It does not make you high smoking it. The worst that can happen to you when smoking it is a massive headache. I won't delve into legalizing marijuana, medical or otherwise, but at least for now, but I would like to point out the reasons what I believe hemp can help save our country. I first came across the innovative idea of industrial hemp replacing sugar after an ADB study recommended it as a replacement for sugar in Fiji nearly two decades ago. Mr. Speaker, it's time we got serious about hemp. Hemp or industrial hemp, it is a variety of the cannabis plant species that is grown specifically for industrial use. It can be used to make a wide range of products. Along with bamboo, hemp is one of the fastest growing plants on earth. It can be refined into a variety of commercial items, including paper, rope, textiles, clothing, biodegradable plastics, paint, insulation, biofuel, food, and animal feed. Please allow me to briefly summarize hemp's benefits. The environmental advantages are manifold. Hemp only takes four months to grow as opposed to sugarcane, which can take up to 16 months to harvest. Hemp requires less water, and due to its ability to return nutrients to the soil, can be the perfect crop rotator for sugarcane. Hemp grows thicker, so less chance for weeds, which means less weedicide and other chemicals, and more harvest yield per acre. Clothing made from hemp is more durable and cost efficient, even being 10 times stronger than cotton and polyester. Growing and harvesting hemp is not only a possible solution to our sugar problems, but also a new raw material input for our struggling garment and textile industry, which imports large quantities of cotton and polyester. Not only is cotton and polyester not good for our environment, because they consume much larger quantities of land, water, and other resources to produce compared to hemp, but they also affect our balance of payments, given we import them as an input for the garment industry. Hemp could replace cotton and polyester as a major input, thereby providing not only farmers with a new viable alternative to sugar and an import substitute to cotton and polyester, but it can also provide the, government, the garment industry with a locally sourced alternative to which they can add value before exporting. 
why don't we grow organic hemp and make self-clothing and accessories stamped with our internationally recognized Fiji brand to feed the growing export market which demands these creative, new, environmentally friendly alternatives. Hemp-derived material can also be made into a cheaper and stronger replacement for wood. This could be used widely in construction where it will be stronger, lighter, and more durable than wood. Lastly, I would like to reiterate the importance of value adding in agriculture, Honorable Speaker. The Fiji 2020 Agriculture Sector Policy Agenda, Modernizing Agriculture, written in 2014, had many aspirations for 2020, but six years later fell woefully short in its execution, and we all know who is to blame for that. COVID? I think not. One thing that report did accurately point out was that, and I quote, given the limitation of government resources, the best way is to present the development agenda as a package of worthy projects for domestic and international investment. Domestic and foreign, foreign investment into agriculture must be encouraged at all costs, including the removal of bureaucratic requirements that stifle the ease of business. I would like to conclude, Mr. Speaker, by stressing that the road to a vibrant, resilient, and self-sufficient economy is a difficult journey, but one that must be taken in a spirit of honesty, transparency, and compassion. It's high time that we all, especially the government, to take heed, that the government take heed of the agriculture revolution, divesting from industries that leave us vulnerable to outside forces such as tourism and sugar, is the surest way to guarantee self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and an economy we can proudly build for future generations. Let's grow Fiji, let's grow. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I thank the Honorable Linda Tumbuya for her contribution.